He titled himself Wolf. He was maybe an inch taller than me, though uh, we were often seated, bodies hunched over bar tab that he claimed he had running since 1983. His hair color of the New York Times went just past his shoulders and his face hid behind enough of a beard that his name was more than appropriate. Wolf sold jewelry to the ones who lived in the mountains. He announced his trust issues early on, which explained why he wore all of his merchandise. Wolf's neck's neck must have weighed at least 60 pounds with all that silver around it, and I cannot really claim to say he had skin on any of his fingers. Each one resembled a totem pole of skinny metal. He called me red and encouraged me to steal dollars from the bar to play DJ on the jukebox. Wolf would lean in when he spoke to me as though he were sniffing for clues of stories on my skin. Pearl Street Pub generally attracted middle-aged white men during the early parts of the day, our preferred hours of drinking, and young frat kids from the local college at night. In the rare occurrence when a woman came in, Wolf and I would flirt our way toward her. He never hit on me. I liked that he treated me like one of his kind. I remember a time a brilliant woman came in with what appeared to be her husband. She exuded a mix of masculinity and femininity. They both took a seat at the bar beside Wolf and I. Without words, it was clear to me that Wolf wanted to see how far we could get with her. She called herself Marl. I can't recall his name. In fact, her husband barely uttered a word. It was like he was just an accessory for her. It took barely a few minutes before she was curving her way toward Wolf and I. Now, aren't you two a curious couple, I recall her uttering. Wolf laughed, and I just curled my chest closer to her. We're just two humans sitting at a bar, I said, lulling our long weeks into a slumber through this delicious tincture of whiskey, waiting to get inspired. Of course, that is when you walked in. This is when she grabbed my thigh, coated in denim and rips. This is also when she grabbed my arm, nude from the shoulder down, and took a pen from her husband's silent pocket. She wrote on my arm, bathroom, follow. I twisted my head around to Wolf, who was watching this happen. He smiled behind his mashup of mustache beard. He knew to keep the husband occupied without me even asking as I let her leave first. Give her time to freshen up her lipstick or whatever else she needed to do to prep for my mouth on hers. I counted to 20 in my head. I nodded to Wolf and whispered, have a whiskey waiting for me. I'm going to be thirsty after this. <laughs> Pearl Street Pub's bathroom was small, sticky, and resembled the inside of an artist's head, scratched out, saturated with words and doodles. She had applied more lipstick, and though I prefer mouths to be nude, I didn't mind disrobing all that wax with my tongue and spit. I kissed her hard, then pulled away. The stalls were too small to do what I wanted, so I just lifted her up on top of the sink, which was wet, but she was about to get wetter. Oh. She had on a pair of navy shorts. I put my hands beneath the flap of fabric resting against her thighs, so smooth she felt like water. I could feel the lace of her underwear, the itch of stitching. I unbuttoned, unzipped, and pulled everything down. If the space between her thighs was titled boot camp, I was about to put my politics aside and enlist in whatever branch of military existed inside her. I dug my tongue around, strengthened the muscles of my mouth with push-ups against what began to harden on her, chin-ups, bicep curls with my taste buds. I ran out of spit at the exact moment she came in my mouth. I swallowed her, helped her shorts back on, headed back to the bar toward whiskey, and Wolf, which patiently waited for me. Lure me into a dark bar, one where my feet have a difficult time lifting up from the curious stick of the floor. One with the jukebox, not of the digital persuasion, a real record flip or homegrown mixtape version with scratches and b-sides. One with free nuts or popcorn and at least three drunks in residence resembling Charles Bukowski. <laughs> One without free wireless, rather a dead zone of internet activity. One with a pool table and enough graffiti in the bathroom to keep you busily reading for hours. One without any Yelp reviews, because everyone leaves too stoned or too drunk to remember to write one. One where there's a well-known myth that a woman gave birth there at one of the booths minutes before giving head to the bartender during his lunch break. One where lovers go to look for new ones. Buy me a pint of something local, and if that seems to involve slur a shot of tequila down my throat, call me the wrong name. Confuse me for the wrong gender and I'll laugh and tell you actually you're right. 
Ask me why you've never seen me here before. Give me a line. I'll throw one back. I will use your cock as a diving board. You'll spit bourbon into my lap because you just weren't expecting that one. You'll say, strap one on and how about we take turns? <laughs> Order me another drink even before I'm finished with this one. Tell me about the time you read Proust while some girl gave you head. And after you came, you wiped her mouth with a torn page from Swan's Way. <laughs> Put your hand on my left thigh. I said my left, not my right. Touch my knee as though you've never felt one up before. Fake how drunk you really are and tiptoe your tipsy fingers further in and up. I give you permission now, so please don't ask later to touch me in ways that make you feel like you're learning the ins and outs of anatomy. Turn your palm into a question mark. Ball it up to resemble the dot at the end and carve your way into me. But before that... Get me another of whatever this is, a double, and when you come back, tell me about the time you lost your passport. So you spent a week sucking on your tongue, lapping up as many whiskey gingers as you could afford at the airport bar. Tell me that when you ran out of money, you rented out your lips to lonely women with long layovers between flights in search of a story to tell their girlfriends titled The Time Some Stranger Gave Out Cunnilingus with a Mouth Smelling of Airport Booze or The Triple Orgasm Inspired by Triple Sec. Order me a shot of something with a clever name that tastes better than it smells. This is the moment the perfect song arrives on the beat-up jukebox, a healthy mix of bass and repetition. I'll get up and almost fall, because this is the moment I recognize my tolerance level for booze is never as high as I think it is. I will unhinge my hips, get my knees involved, my shoulders will lift and fall, my neck will twist, my back will gather sweat like little love notes beating up into heated puddles. It won't matter that there really isn't a dance floor, and I'm the only one moving like this. Sometimes bodies need to slur their way towards sound. You will watch. And whatever rests against your zipper will rise like a patriotic emblem. It will be dark enough that you can rub your nationalistic citizen without fear of getting thrown out. I may collapse during this time, but just let me fall. Let the music gather around me. Keep rubbing. Keep drinking. Keep flirting with the ones who linger around you. This gets me off as well watching, wearing the observations around me like secrets I keep until I can touch them off me. When the music no longer entertains me, I'll press myself against the parts of you that desire impact. I'll tell you I'm ready to leave now as we make our way back home to our pocket of Brooklyn. We'll walk up the two flights to our front door and you'll fuck me as though we were the strangers we were pretending to be in that bar. <laughs> A 72-year-old ex-dominatrix with a slave and a master who drank seltzer and cranberry juice with me on a Thursday evening at Happy Ending Lounge that used to be a massage parlor and has since been swallowed by New York City greedy realtors. Her, painty, her painted lips were so red, it was as though they had been in a gang fight, bloodied and swollen. She begged me to suck on them to turn them into a new shape. This is about James who alphabetized his fetishes at the same bar, different night, and on the third pint, acted several of them out with me. This is about Michael. His grandfather dead only hours as we sipped whiskey on the rocks at an Irish pub in Midtown, told me stories of how his grandfather survived the Holocaust, three bouts of cancer, but died from a drunk driver hit and run. This is about the one who calls himself Sailor. Met him on a Wednesday evening at Union Hall Bar in Brooklyn. Drank pints of beer as he wrote lines by Jean Genet on my arm. He showed me pictures of the nude women he photographs for a living. Asked me to join his collection. Wanted to know what I'd call my best side. I followed him home that night and made love to his wife while he watched and occasionally joined in. Afterward, we smoked hash nude on their dark blue couch reading Bukowski back and forth. This is about Maggie, the beautifully tattooed trans woman wearing a leather collar, smoking an electronic cigar at the Delancey Bar on the Lower East Side. She wanted to know if one could be monogamous with language. 
She called herself polyamorous with dialects and often mixed sounds together to create new tongues. She called herself a curious linguist, also an aspiring undertaker. This is about Crystal, the full-figured Jamaican who smelled of coconut oil and talcum powder. We met at a queer bar in Hartford, Connecticut in December, flirting over the pool table with shots of tequila between us. I walked her home with the soundtrack of the nearby train hollering in the distance. She kissed me with double-pierced tongue and slipped her fingers inside my pants inside me as though she just needed a place to warm them from the almost winter air. This is about Carlton, who lives in a basement two doors down from Black Sheep Pub in Brooklyn. To afford rent, he ran errands for others and sold drugs. We drank Guinness beers and smoked stolen cigarettes. He told me he was abandoned as a baby because of his rare skin condition, epidermodysplasia, and lived in various homes where he was shunned, even by those who chose him. He told me about the night he tried to burn all his skin off, thinking it would offer him the chance to live a more normal life. He had been drunk and smoked enough crack that he felt like his body was numb enough to survive the pain, dumped lighter fluid on his limbs, and set himself on fire. He cried in my arms in that dark bar as he wept that he wished for his old skin back. True story, just last night, I was in a Ukrainian bar in the East Village, and the moment I looked out the window, I noticed Esmeralda. No leather this time, just denim jacket, but I recognized the language of her face. No red lipstick, but I remember those lips in the dark. I wanted to run after her, but she probably wouldn't remember me. I was just part of one night in the context of so many others. I will just have to wait until we find ourselves in the same bar again. Thanks,